Yo, how are you guys doing? Welcome back to Rule of Two Review and welcome back to another mini Q&A. So we haven't done one of these in a very, very long time. I am super excited because I love, absolutely love doing the Q&As with you guys. They have been so much fun in the past. And I know that I haven't done one of my normal long form Q&As in quite a while as well. A lot of you guys who have been around the channel for a long time know that I typically do Q&As with like 12 to 15 questions. They usually run about 45 minutes. They're a lot of fun. You guys really seem to enjoy them and I get so many good questions. But since I've been doing live streams lately, finally got up in the world with a webcam so I can do cool live stream things, I've been able to do some of those sorts of interactions and be able to get the Q&A sort of thing out of the way via that outlet. But I do like the idea of still taking a couple of questions on you from you guys on Twitter and on Facebook and just kind of putting together the mini version of a Q&A. And so that's what we're going to do today. I have four questions I picked from you guys. I asked you on Twitter and on Facebook, of course, on the Rule of Two Review pages, which you should absolutely follow. If you are not following me there, I am super, super active on Twitter for sure. And um, I asked you guys for a couple of questions. I've got two questions from Twitter, two questions from Facebook. And that is what we're going to do. And again, I will remind you, if you want to be a part of these conversations and be a part of the Q&As when I do them in the future, following me on Twitter and Facebook is the best way to do so. So let's go ahead and start with today's first question from Twitter. This comes from Working Class Jedi at 18 Soshi. I love that name, Working Class Jedi. Good stuff. So what is up? Thank you for being the first question today. And Working Class Jedi asks me, Nintendo have had a great 2017 if they use Metroid, Yoshi, Animal Crossing, Pokemon, a new IP, maybe Pikmin, in 2018. Do you think they can keep it up for 2019 as pretty much all major franchises will have been used at once? Plus, will it be too soon to use them again? Mario slash Zelda. Okay, so... A lot going on there, and I uh, did my best to read a little bit of the broken English and complete sentences there, so I pretty much got an idea of what question you're asking. So again, thank you so much for it, and it's a good point, and it certainly relates to a lot of topics and a lot of videos that I have discussed on Rule of Two Review before. So basically what he or she is getting at is that 2017 was so awesome. We know there were so many great first party games. We've all discussed it a jillion times. And then we know of a couple of things coming out in 2018, a couple of big franchises from Nintendo that we still don't have dates for. If a lot of those also come out in 2018, what happens to 2019? It's a really, really good question, and I have discussed it before. Does 2019 suddenly become barren for Nintendo? How can they possibly have any first-party content to continue to make people happy and sell Switches to people if they've already burned through all of their major franchises by the time that time hits? So... Basically, my my ultimate feeling here is that I think you're putting a lot of emphasis on the on, on the idea of Metroid and Pokemon coming out in 2018. To me, those are the linchpin titles as of right now. And again, you guys have heard me discuss those titles and how they factor into Nintendo's future a couple of times. So we know that those games are coming, Metroid and Pokemon. We know that they're going to be huge. They represent two of Nintendo's biggest franchises that they own. And if those come out in 2018, that does certainly leave a big gap, possibly in 2019. But it also depends on if those games really come out in 2018. We have to remember it's not confirmed. And I have said 1,048 times, I think that's the actual time you guys have heard, the actual amount of times you've heard me say this, that I think those two games, if not one of them, will be coming out actually in 2019 which basically does two things. It frees up space in 2018, and it gets one of Nintendo's major franchises out in 2019, if not both. And I, I happen to feel that both of those games will be 2019 titles. So we have to think about 2018, and there's a huge title that you did, I believe, leave off of this list, which is Fire Emblem. That is a massive franchise to remember. We will be getting in 2018. And I have touched on this so many times, so I don't want to repeat too much of my feelings here because I have made videos on this, but we know that Yoshi and Kirby and Fire Emblem are confirmed for 2018. Let's say we don't get Metroid and Pokemon in 2018. There's a lot of other franchises I've discussed could show up and that I think might do it. Pikmin, which you bring up, is actually one of them. A new IP is also one of them. Animal Crossing, I think, is the sneaky, really good shot for a super high-profile Nintendo franchise to launch in 2018. 18 and if that happens let's say that happens and we get fire emblem kirby yoshi animal crossing and a new pikmin and or smash brothers whether it's smash 5 or probably going to be a wii u remake you've got five to six 
big first party Nintendo franchises that will easily fill out a lot of 2018, especially when you factor in that I also believe we're going to continue to see some good third party support coming for the Nintendo Switch. So, You've got you've got a you've got at least six months covered there. If Nintendo did one main franchise a month, that's half of the year. You pepper in a couple of other smaller things, some good third-party content. You got a pretty solid 2018. If we end up seeing more multi-platform stuff coming to the Switch as well, and then you've taken two of your biggest franchises, Pokemon and Metroid, and you move those into 2019. So there we have a strong start to 2019. And to, you know, to wrap this up and really kind of complete the answer to your question, I've discussed other Nintendo franchises that could fill out the next couple of years for Nintendo. New Super Mario Brothers is a huge one, possibly a Mario Maker. We could be getting Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker, Kid Icarus, Star Fox, F-Zero, I mean, Earthbound. There's a lot of different things that Nintendo could continue to do. So I think we've got enough to go on right now. We need to wait and see what happens. If they announce Pokemon and Metroid are coming out in 2018, then that does change the game, and suddenly their biggest heavy hitters will be out by the time of year two being over, and then year three, which would be 2019, that's where they would be left almost entirely with just their mid-tier games. And those are great games, but are they the kind of games that push systems the way Zelda, Metroid, Pokemon, Mario do? Probably not. So, it'll be interesting to see. It's a long time before we get a new mainline Mario and a mainline Zelda, so I would just remove those games from your from your brain. And if we're going to get Zelda or Mario games in the next couple years, they're going to be spin-offs and things like that, like a new Super Mario Brothers, for example. So, yeah, that's how that kind of wraps up. So, thank you again so much for the question. Okay, next question on Twitter comes to us from BLP Sean at British Playing on Twitter. Thank you so much again, Sean, for this question. And he asks me, do you think too much importance is put on review scores? For instance, less than 7 out of 10 equals bad, or developer bonuses tied to scores? So a very, very good and interesting question, actually. And there's really, to me, technically two questions going there. So to answer the first part, do I think that there's too much importance put on review scores? I think that that part of your question more has to do with maybe like the gamer and the consumer. And do we, as gamers, who buy games and pay attention to the industry and are talking on social media and on YouTube about games that are good or bad or whatever, do we put too much weight and investment into the review score of a game? And I think that for most of the time that review scores have existed, yes. And I do think that also, even today, that is still true for the most part. But I do think that we're maybe kind of getting to an age where some people are willing to pay less attention to that because there's so much of that stuff out there. There's so many different ways to consume a review score and there's Metacritic and there's Rotten Tomatoes and there's all these things. The YouTube gaming community is so huge right now with so many people being able to review games. I'm actually hoping to be able to start to start doing legitimate like embargoed reviews pretty soon. I know I have a couple of review codes on the way in the next couple of months. And so you get, you know, people who do like what we do on YouTube being able to tell you, hey, this game is good or this game is bad. And there's less of a review score coming from a lot of those kinds of outlets telling us if games are good or not. But, I mean, let's be real here. Real here. Still, the review score does exist. It is a big thing. We all pay attention to the IGNs and the GameSpots and the Metacritics, and we get excited when the numbers reflect our own feelings, and we get upset when the numbers don't reflect our own feelings, and we'll all say, well, this game got a 58 on Metacritic, so it has to be garbage, because obviously. And So yes, we all do that. I'm guilty of it. I do it all the time. I'm sure most of you guys do as well. So is there too much weight and importance being put on those? Again, for the most part, I do think yes. Because, and this applies to the movie world as well, man, sometimes you just know if something works for you. And it is okay to like something that has a 7 out of 10 review. I mean, I actually think a 7 out of 10 is a good score. That's like baseline, probably worth your purchase kind of score. And then you get into stuff that's the fives and sixes, and that's how it reviews. But there are a lot of games that get low review scores that I love. I think that they're gems, and I think that sometimes a game... I, this has been such a hot topic the last couple of weeks, especially because of Sonic Forces and the weird controversy around people maybe liking Sonic Forces. I've yet to play it, so I can't yet say... I do want to try the game. I think it, it looks like a good Sonic game, but the reviews certainly aren't very good. So anyway, the point is, it th there is something to be said for liking a game when it's just okay. And then you get into dissecting, well, when is a game just okay? When is a game very great? When is a game garbage? We, we really rely on these review scores and these numbers. And I think that in, in a culture where we have so much internet access to just throwing our opinions out there and agreeing with numbers or disagreeing with numbers or assigning our own numbers, that everyone's way too caught up probably in review scores. But 
I mean, it's not like they don't still have some relevance. I mean, let me let me just add this part to it too. There's something to be said for review scores. I don't think that the numbers are completely benign, and I do certainly rely on them, and a good example is like Zelda and Mario. Like, those games have 97 Metacritics. Ocarina of Time is like a 98 or a 99, the highest ever, and it's like, well, I agree with those. Those numbers make sense to me. I've played the games. I know that they're that good, and obviously all these people who reviewed it also feel the same way, and so that does count for something I think they're being accurate. And same when a not-so-good game gets a bad score. Like, for example, the Metacritic score is very low for Sonic Forces, and once I play it, I'll be able to state whether or not I agree with that, and the game is actually bad and deserves bad scores, or if it's okay, and maybe it deserves that 7 out of 10 as opposed to a 5 out of 10. So, so that's that. The developer thing, the bonuses tied to scores thing, that's a messy controversy, a controversy, as some people would say. And I'm not going to lie, you guys, I, I do believe that it is almost considered fact or at least a proven fact that that is definitely true in the video game industry. But I can't remember the last time I saw anything that told us that was 100% true. So there might be a little bit of assumption we have when we go into the idea of developers getting paid bonuses when their review scores are good. Um, but let's just go on the on the assumption. Let's just operate for a second that it is actually fact that de developers do get bonuses tied to scores. That's tricky, because I actually think that there is good and bad to that. I know you might think instantly we should just jump on the idea of that being a bad thing. As in, oh, that's so, you should never incentivize that kind of thing, and you shouldn't use money to try to convince, you know, game, game developers to do these. It's a shady business practice. And it's like, is it really, though? Because if the end product becomes a, ga is, becomes a game that's good, that people like, and people buy it more because it's actually quality... There's kind of no real foul there. It's a little bit, it does tread into like the commission-based scenario. And I'm somebody who spent a lot of my time in sales and I've had a few commission-based jobs in the past. And we've even seen scandals in the last year or so about commission-based entities and businesses making huge mistakes and screwing people over because of the incent incentivizing. And so it does tread into that, which is why it's ultimately probably not preferred. I think it is shady enough that it shouldn't happen. But if we look at it from the other angle, if it, if it happens in a clean way, which is a hard thing to believe in the gaming industry, but let's say it happens in a clean way, all it's doing is saying, hey, game developer A, make this game, and I'll tell you what, if the game turns out to be good, if the industry and the consumer turn out to like it, and the review scores reflect that you did a good job, you get a little bonus, you get a kickback. I work in a corporate job right now for a huge company in the United States, and it is very much a bonus-based company and pay structure and it's all about if you do a good job and there's the metrics and the numbers and, and the proof of quality to show you did a good job you get a little bonus so it incentivizes you to just do well it doesn't incentivize you to rip people off and in the gaming thing it doesn't necessarily incentivize you to lie to people about what you're doing it's just make the game good and so it it initially comes off i think is really skeezy and uncomfortable i get that it, it me too I, that's what i thought but then it's like well wait a minute if nothing bad happens and all we get is just a good game and no one's getting ripped off, what does it hurt? Maybe the developers who busted their butt to make this game really good, they probably deserve a little bit of kickback. And that's their, that's how they make their living, so why should we take that away from them? So, long answer to this, I know, but at the end of the day, I think it's probably, it's just a gray area. And I think that there's a lot of good to the idea and there's a lot of bad to the idea. I don't work in the industry, I'm assuming most of you guys don't either, so let's just let it play out the way it is and then hope that no one ends up just making bad games. Alright, let's move over to Facebook for the next two questions here before we wrap up. First Facebook question comes from Matthew John Daniel Welch, who I know I've answered your question before because you have a very long name, but you ask really good questions, so thank you Matthew for the question. He asks me, do you think we will see a Star Wars Battlefront 3 after the reception that the second one has received recently? Keep up the good work, dude. Hope you're doing well. Thank you so much, Matthew. I am doing incredibly well. And man, we got to get into the Battlefront 3, the Battlefront thing a little bit here. Uh, of course, I was going to get a Battlefront question. And I toyed with not answering this because the Battlefront thing has been so crazy and so polarizing and people were mad at me because of the video I made last week, even though I thought it was a very excellent video. I was the first person to point out the gamer's voice was affecting positive change for this thing. And I was the first person that I saw from anywhere that pointed out the idea of Lucasfilm or Disney telling EA to fix the problems with Battlefront. I was the one who did that first. Go check the video. Go check the date. That all came from me, and it was one of my weirdly lowest viewed videos, and people were like, really, it was just so controversial for, I don't even know why. Anyway, that's not what this is about. The point is, 
I thought about, I don't really want to talk on the Battlefront thing because it's just a crazy thing, but I was like, you know, this is a good question. I'm invested in Star Wars, obviously. It's my favorite thing in the world. I'm invested in Battlefront. So what the hell's gonna, what the hell is gonna happen with Battlefront? Will we see a Battlefront 3? Good question. I'm going to say maybe, and it's kind of a cop-out answer, but honestly, I don't really know that any of us can possibly answer that right now. We have a long way to go to really understanding how the fallout from the Battlefront 2 fiasco is really going to be. I think it's going to be pretty bad. It's already been pretty bad. And we also have to see what happens with the Star Wars license. There is the possibility that Lucasfilm and Disney decide to pull the license from EA. They decide to sever their contract, whatever they did, 10 years of licensing rights with EA. Who knows? Maybe that gets canceled. It's tricky because we know there's a couple of other Star Wars games in the works behind the scenes. We had Respawn's game, we had Visceral's game, we know things are changing there. I theorize that those games have been pushed into one, but if they haven't, then that means, excuse me, that there's actually two games that exist. So, you know, it might be really hard or even just impossible for, for that contract to be severed, unless somebody breaks, like, a, a clause within it, and I don't think that EA has yet done that. So, you know... It really depends on what happens with EA and if they're still making games. And if they are, do they want to go near the Battlefront name again? Because this fiasco has been so bad and so messy, so publicly messy. And it's and they're getting investigated and all these different things. So I think that in four or five months, maybe even sooner, but in a couple of months, we're going to see what happens with the current Battlefront 2. Is EA actually going to reinstate microtransactions and loot boxes? And if they do... Are they going to do it in a way that's fine in the cosmetic thing we all talk about that no one really cares about? Or are they going to find a way to skeezily just work in the really crummy, poorly implemented pay-to-win pay to kind of stuff that started this whole thing? And if they do, what happens to the Battlefront 2 name then? And what happens to EA? So, we have to see what happens there and what decisions are made. I think that if the Battlefront 2 thing doesn't get any worse... And if over the course of the next six months to year, it all subsides, nothing, nothing controversial happens from it again, it doesn't get in the news for all these bad things that it's been getting in the news for this past week, and if EA does keep their Star Wars contract, that yeah, there's a decent chance that we do still get a Battlefront 3, EA's Battlefront 3, in another couple of years. I mean, they probably won't be making it in time for Episode 9, but I think, I think it may certainly still happen. And then... The whole question is, how do they do it? Do they, do they from the get-go know they can't do any of these things? Or do they dare try to do it again? And I would think that they wouldn't try to do it again. And they would just make a simpler, good, basic, simple Battlefront 3 the way it's supposed to be. But more than that, I would probably say the higher percentage, in my personal opinion, as a Star Wars expert and a video game fan, that we probably won't get that. I just feel like at this point the tainting of the name and the whole situation surrounding EA and Star Wars and the Battlefront name, I think it's too severe. We have the law involved now. They're being investigated. The Battlefront whole business model is being investigated. So I just think that it might be, like I've already said, tainted a little bit too much for them to want to touch again. So my, my wish is for it to happen. I want Battlefront 3. I want it to be a better Battlefront. I want it to be the Battlefront that I thought Battlefront 2 was going to be before all this garbage came out in this last week. I will say, I'm playing the game. You guys can hate me and unsubscribe if you want, but I'm playing the game. And the gameplay is good. The multiplayer is great. The story is really interesting to me. It's everything I want gameplay-wise and canon-wise from a game. But it's obvious the holes because of everything that they pulled out with the microtransactions thing. And never once would I ever have supported anything they were doing with this business model once it became public a week ago. Absolutely not ever once did I ever say that it was a good thing. And they deserve to be called on that on this. And I hope that they fix these problems going forward. So that's why I want to see a Battlefront 3 that is the right kind of Battlefront game that doesn't have any of these garbage things in it. So at the end of the day, I want it. And I want it to be good, but more than likely, I don't think we're going to see it. All right, and our last question for today, also coming from Facebook, comes from Craig Whitney. Thank you so much for the question, Greg. And he says, Hi Rob, this is my question. What do you think about the storage situation regarding third-party games on the Nintendo Switch? As the game cards available for third-party developers are up to 32 gigs. Going forward, would you prefer that they use these higher storage cards, preventing the need for micro SD card storage, and charge the consumer a higher price for the games? Or would that not be smart business on the developer side? All right. That's a big question. That's a great question. Thank you so much, Craig, for it. 
This has also been a big topic the last couple of months, the storage situation for the Nintendo Switch. What's available on the console out of the box? Why do we need to get micro SD cards? How much do micro SD cards for all the different sizes, these third party companies releasing third party games that are very appealing and everyone's very excited for, but the physical copies, not the digital downloads, but the physical copies of these games are also being put sometimes on the smaller storage Nintendo Switch game cards, which require massive extra downloads from the eShop to be able to complete the experience and suddenly you're taking up so much space on your Nintendo Switch. And again, the internal storage is so small that a lot of games you couldn't even play if it was the only game you had, even if it's a physical copy going into your Switch. And so it's forcing people in a way that they feel uncomfortable to have to buy more storage for the Switch. And you know, it's it's a it's a big it's a big topic. There's a lot to talk about here because a lot of it also comes down on Nintendo. Way 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 back months ago, when the Switch was still pretty new, it started to come out that hey, a couple of these third-party games might be costing a little bit more on the Nintendo Switch because there's a physical store, there's a physical cartridge being used for the games, and you know they have to pay a higher price if they're gonna if they're gonna use the 32 gig card so that you don't have to download as much on the eShop, and that becomes a problem because Switch games are gonna be ten dollars more than the competition, and all these different things. And at that time, I discussed, and I still believe a lot of this. I discussed the fact that. It kind of comes down on Nintendo deciding to go with a business model, which is the Switch, which I love implicitly, and a, 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 a games media for the Switch, which are cartridges, which I also love implicitly. And they chose this business model, model and these cartridges in a way that allows for the possibility for some games to cost more. So suddenly their business model has this one flaw in it, and some people might see this as a flaw. I see it as kind of a flaw, I definitely do. Where, hey, you know, we chose we chose the console, that means sometimes games are just going to cost more, or you're going to have to download a ridiculous amount of downloadable patches and updates to complete your game, or get the some of the multiplayer maps or the multiplayer modes just on your game, just simply because they couldn't fit on the game, and that takes up extra storage, and we only put 32 gigs on the machine, and all these different things. It's getting kind of cyclical here. And so what's the answer? What's the real solution to this problem? Given that we're in this situation currently, I feel like the best thing to do at this point is probably, it's it's really hard to answer this, guys. I, re I feel like there is no one good answer for everybody. Everyone's going to have a different opinion. All I can do is share mine. And I'm probably somebody who, I don't really mind having the smaller game cards and having to download extra stuff to complete the game. I've got 128 gigs in there. I don't buy very, very many digital games, only games that are digital that are digital only, like indie games are the only things I'll buy. I'm buying physical copies, so that is still sparing me a lot of space because I have physical cards I'm playing my games on. And so I don't mind, you know, I would like rather save the money on a more expensive Switch version of a game and just download the extra 10, 15, 18 gigs it takes to complete a game or whatever. And I'm fine with that. And if I have to start deleting and re-downloading and stuff, I mean, I'll do that. I hate doing that. But to be fair, I do that with my Xbox and PlayStation right now. And so at this point, if Nintendo's going to do it as much as I dislike it, I can't fault them any more than I fault the other guys. It's just the dumb thing that we live in in 2017 gaming. That being said, I don't actually think that's the smartest answer for everybody. I kind of feel like the smarter answer probably is for these third-party companies to just start using bigger Nintendo Switch cards, use the 32 gig cards, or do they go up to 64 for getting? No, it wouldn't be that. That's way too big. So use these 32 gig these 32 gig cards, third-party companies. And you know what? If you're going to charge another 10 bucks, I guess just charge another 10 bucks. I mean, it's a hard thing to say. It's a hard thing for me to throw all the other Nintendo Switch gamers under the bus and say, hey, guess what? I'm telling you that you have to pay $10 more for your Nintendo Switch games just because that's the way I think it's supposed to be. I do feel bad saying that, but for some reason, that just seems like the better, easier win for everybody. People don't like having to buy extra storage for their Nintendo Switch. I mean, we have to do it anyway, which is why that's my preferred way. Um, but people just don't like doing that, and it was, it's was it been such a scandal, you know, if I want to say scandal, the past couple weeks. And I just feel like if, if they're going to charge an extra 10 bucks, just do that. Make it a quick, easy, simple thing. You don't have to download anything extra. You just put your game card into your Switch, and it's good from the jump. You don't have to do anything fancy. Maybe you get that little one gig download that takes like two seconds, but that doesn't really affect much of anything. And I think that everyone wins. And you know what? Like, the Rhyme developers, like, they offered extra goods, like a soundtrack and stuff for the extra $10 they're charging. I think if that became the norm, 
the physical Switch copy might cost an extra $10 sometimes for some games, but when it does, companies are going to be giving us an extra bonus, like, I don't know, like a t-shirt or a soundtrack or a fancy box. I mean, myriad different things that they could come up with. I feel like that's going to be the best the best way. I am sad that Nintendo's business model allows for this to happen. I think it's an unfortunate drawback that Nintendo has to go through that the Xbox and the PlayStation do not have to go through. But it is what it is. To me, it's, it's a problem, but it's not the biggest problem in the world, so it's never bothered me too much. And that's why I can easily say, I have my preference, don't charge me an extra 10 bucks, just make everything downloadable on the smaller cards and I'll just deal with the space. But I do think that the smarter thing, the smarter thing to do for the wider consumer is to just probably charge the extra 10 bucks and hey, throw us something cool for free. All right, well, that's it, guys. This is the Q&A for today. And it felt really good to do this. I really want to do another long form one. And I probably will in a couple of months. But for now, I'm enjoying the occasional live stream. And you guys seem to really enjoy those as well. So that's it. Thank you so much to the four folks who uh, whose questions I did decide to answer today. Really good questions covering a variety of topics. I really enjoyed talking about it all. And uh, yeah, I think that's going to be it for now. So re a reminder, you can be a part of these in the future if you want to follow me on Facebook or Twitter. I am most active on Twitter for sure. So that's, that's the real best place to find me. So that'll be it. Thanks so much as always for tuning in, guys. This is Rob of Rule to Review, and I will catch you next time on another video.